Hello, I'd like to welcome everybody to this next session, which is A2, and it's the patient safety-themed session. We're going to get started very shortly, um, because we were a little bit late starting, and so we, we um, want to make sure that we've got enough time for the speakers. Um, just to so you know who I am, I'm Bridie Kent, I'm Professor of Nursing at Deakin University and Eastern Health in Melbourne, Victoria, in Australia. And um, so I'm chairing the session. We've got, th we've got three sp um, s um, series of uh, talks today. We'll have about 25 minutes per, speak per session. And there'll be a little bit of time for question immediately afterwards. And then what I'll do is I'll get, um, get all the speakers to come up onto the stage at the end. And we'll have probably about five minutes for questions then. So we've got, um, there's, there's actually four speakers, um, two are working on a similar project, and they'll be the first, um, first two to come up onto the stage. So we've got Richard Thompson, he's from Newcastle in the UK, in England, and he's going to be talking about evidence-based patient involvement in improving patient safety, along with a colleague of his, John Wright. So I'd like to um, invite Richard up onto the stage, and, or John, whichever one's going to come up first, both, right? And um, would you like to put the hands together for Richard and John, please? Uh, bonjour et bienvenue. Um, there's been a big international push for getting patients involved in patient safety, but there's also a big gap about how this can be achieved and whether, whether it works or not. So Richard and myself are going to talk this morning about our, our work in progress, really, but our, our early efforts to address this gap in the evidence and uh, we hope it's going to be, provide some useful um, tools for you to take back um, to, to try yourself. We're, um, we're just puppets on the stage, um, part of a larger team, including um, Rebecca Lawton and Ian Watt down here. Seems to be the order of the day to stand up, Rebecca and Ian. So a round of applause for Rebecca and Ian. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and the wider team, but also particularly the, the patients and the patient panels have been so crucial in developing our work today. So our work is uh, funded by the National Institute of Health Research, and uh, there's four strands. The first is around developing a patient reporting system. We know from the research literature that patients can be a rich and very complementary source of information about error reporting. Um, but we also know that our attempts to get patients to report tend not to work. And our suspicion is that it's because of systems designed by professionals for professionals. So we want to develop a, a system that's um, developed by patients for patients. The second strand is to develop a patient measure of organizational safety. And this copies some of uh, uh, examples from other industries, high-risk industries, which recognize that prevention is better than the cure. And uh, if we're going to try and prevent errors, we need to understand what's going on, the latent failures in systems, so that we can assess and proactively deal with potential errors. The third is development of a, an intervention to improve patient safety, and, and Rich is going to talk about that. This is a, an extra layer of Swiss cheese in the Swiss cheese model. And the final one, when you come to conferences like this, often the most, um, the most memorable sessions are those... Um, held by patients and carers relating their own experiences of harm. And uh, we want to capitalize on this and look at how patients and carers can share these lessons with, in this case, junior doctors, to see whether that improves patient safety. So it's a talk on patient safety, and uh, here is the obligatory slide from Jim Reason. Um, and really identifies the different sort of, sort of areas, the, the latent failures and the active failures that can contribute to, for example, a medication error. And what we're trying to do on the left-hand side of the slide is to develop uh, a patient measure of organizational safety to identify latent failures. Patients on wards are potentially ideally placed to, to pick up on safe em environments. And at the right-hand side of the, um, the slide, the active failures, looking at how patients can actu actually report when things go wrong. So, we, over the last couple of years, we've been developing these, these tools. The first, the PMOS, Patient Measure of Organizational Safety. 
It's been a lot of work in interviewing, and f in interviewing patients and staff, uh, develop focus groups to identify items, um, a systematic review to provide the first evidence-based framework for contributing factors. Um, I have to say, without prejudice, it's probably one of the most important papers of the year in this edition of the Quality and Safety in Healthcare Journal. Rush out after this session and buy your copy. Um, and uh, then development of a draft questionnaire, piloting it and testing its reliability, validity, factor analysis. Um, so we've come up with, a, a, in the end, a 38-item questionnaire. This is an example from one of the wards looking at the contributory factors in key domains such as communication, leadership. And you can compare wards across hospitals and across organisations. So uh, the second strand, the patient involvement in uh, patient incident reporting tool, uh, looks at how we can learn from patients about errors. And for this, again, over the last couple of years, we've been working with um, focus groups of staff and patients um, to look at how we can develop a really patient-centered reporting tool. Um, this has come up with three, three potential models, one face-to-face -face interviewing, um, the second a hotline, and the third looking at um, the traditional written feedback, those empty suggestion boxes on wards. Um, and uh, we've uh, tested this, we've, we've done it in about 160 patients, came up with a sort of similar number, 160 of, uh, of error reports that we found. And um, this has allowed us to understand what works. Face-to-face -face interviewing is by far the, uh, the most the, the commonest source of um, these, the patient error reporting. Um, but also get views from patients about how they can be prevented. Um, what we found is that um, patients don't distinguish between latent and active failures. So when they're actually reporting errors, they'll often report latent failures as well. And when you compare the PMOS and the PERT, these two acronyms, then um, you find considerable triangulation between the two. So, for example, the top line on here, staff having to wait a long time for porters. We found the red is bad in these sort of slides. And we found that a lot of patients reported this on the, on the PMOS. And when it came to the actual reports, we found this was triangulated from patients saying that they'd been delayed because of porters, delays in porters. You know, there's potential importance for safety, but also efficiency of organizations. And here's another example, um, the one at the bottom, for example, the physical environment um, being uh, identified on the, the patient measure of organizational safety. And in the reports from the patients, you know, these sort of slippery shower trays just waiting for patients to fall and break their hips. Um, our next step, recognizing this overlap, is to we've combined them, the PERTMOS. Um, we'll probably find a catcher acronym with time. Um, but, uh, and we're developing a paperless basis for collecting this information. These sort of tools are the starting point, just like a clinical guideline is crucial for changing practice, but, but it all depends on the implementation. So the next phase of this very applied project is to, is to recognize that we need to work with clinicians in hospital to, uh, to see how we can develop feedback of this sort of information that's useful for them and how they can act on it to change practice. So this is all focused on changing practice. So we're, going to, we're, we're working on this at the moment and we're going to do a, a randomized cluster trial or a step wedge um, design trial next year to see whether this improves, improves safety. So the uh, final, the final um, project I'm going to talk about is that of patients as teachers. Um, and uh, again, trying to tap into this very emotionally powerful source of, um, of, of how patient safety affects patients themselves. Um, we've, uh, we want to undertake a cluster randomized trial of this. And we're, we've, we, we're at a stage now where we've undertaken a feasibility trial, which has demonstrated acceptability, giving us a chance to work out how to measure the sort of impact of patient narratives on junior doctors in this case. This is first year junior doctors. Um, and then undertaking a randomized control trial of about 500 junior doctors in, the, in Yorkshire in the north of England. And we're just at the stage of completing that trial. And uh, when, when we um, present in London next year, hopefully we'll uh, have the results of that. So, so this is a, an overview of three of the projects, a, a, a taster, a degustation. Um, Richard's now going to provide, serve up the uh, le plat principal um, by giving in more detail about the, the fourth project.
Thank you, John. And um, before I move on, I'd also like to uh, recognise um, Susan Hrissos, who's the Senior Research Associate and, and probably in the audience here today, who did the majority of the work that, um, in driving forward this component of the project. Um, what we set out to do in this part of the project was to really develop interventions that could facilitate patients who are inpatients in hospital in improving their own safety. Now you will know that there are a number of pro approaches that have been developed internationally um, from the Speak Up uh, leaflets um, produced by the Joint Commission, the Danish Patient Safety Handbook, um, the Clean Your Hands campaign in the UK that had a patient focused component asking patients, encouraging patients to ask clinicians whether they'd washed their hands. But our sense was that the majority of these approaches had been developed um, without much in the way of patient engagement in that process and without much reference to the theoretical underpinnings of such interventions um, and without much evaluation. So we wanted to, if you like, go back to basics on that um, and start to develop a, a complex intervention that would promote um, patient involvement that was grounded in the perspective of the, of the user and, and we mean by that patients and carers and their families, but also um, clinicians on the wards, that was achieved through um, consultation with the relevant users and produced a uh, collaborative, mutually acceptable model, uh, mutually acceptable to patients and families and to the clinicians on the wards that would need to implement a, an approach to improve patient safety with a with the patient right at the centre of that. This um, work involved several components to it, a qualitative study with interviews of patients, relatives and frontline healthcare staff um, from acute and, uh, and elective medical and surgical wards. We also uh, undertook some brainstorming workshops with expert patients and experts in the field of um, patient safety and also in the field of safety in other industries. Um, and then we gradually developed our um, interventions in a number of interactive, iterative workshops with patients and relatives, expert patients and frontline healthcare staff. We sought very much to engage patients and the public throughout the process, so not just as uh, informants of the development of our uh, materials, but also as, as co-members of our research team. Um, so, for example, they um, worked with us as observers in focus group meetings and they worked with us to help with recruitment, etc. So we had a, um, a, a, a very uh, engaged approach to patient and public involvement in this piece of work. Alongside that, we undertook a system, systematic examination of the current evidence um, through systematic reviews of the literature, um, looking at both the um, tools that have been developed in the past, but more particularly, I think, in, at the rigour of how they were developed and the degree of patient involvement. We did a very broad um, scoping exercise internationally to identify campaigns and initiatives that were ongoing. And we also undertook uh, a process of identifying relevant behaviour change theory that would help to inform the design um, and hence increase the likelihood of the desired impact. Slightly complicated slide, but what two or three key points to make. that From this, we've designed a complex intervention that um, begins before admission for elective patients, proceeds throughout their inpatient stay, um, and then has a, a, an additional pre-discharge component. And the three key bits of this I'll talk about um, separately now. Um, the first of these is a, a theory-based DVD providing a sort of an airline-style safety brief um, for patients prior to admission. Um, and that's uh, addressing a number of informational and educational needs, um, as well as addressing some of the key beliefs that might act as barriers to patient involvement. Um, and we did find, uh, a, a, in alignment with others, that patients are rather reluctant um, to ask questions. Um, and what we found from interviews with patients and clinicians was that there's also a sense that there's a need for permission to exist for that to happen, uh, which is why we felt it was important to address the development of this intervention from both the clinical and the patient perspective. Um, so one of the components of the DVD will be supporting and enhancing through um, clinicians based in the hospitals um, the um, a, a receptiveness to patient engagement in these issues and to asking questions and to being engaged. 
The second key component is a patient handbook or logbook that will um, travel, sit with the patient throughout their stay and includes a number of components, some of which would be specific to the individual ward, some of which are specific to the individual patient, and one of the key components being a question notepad so that patients can note down throughout their patient's stay key things that they want to ask. Um, as you know, people often, questions come into their head, there's no one around to ask at the time, everyone's busy or perceived to be busy, and this was felt by both patients and uh, clinicians to be a very valuable potential source of supporting um, engagement. But that would then need to be embedded within the ward routine, if you like, in one way or another. And this will vary dependent on the particular individual ward routine. Some wards already in, that we're working with have daily um, sit-down sessions with a nurse who can then use that session as a way of reminding and interacting with the patient and looking at their logbook and um, having the sorts of discussions that will help to um, enhance their, their safety as, as inpatients. That was a very quick run through and if anyone's interested, very happy to talk in more detail about that. So we've developed the tools, we're in the process of finalising um, those pilot tools at the moment um, and we're going to be doing a pilot study across several wards in a couple of hospitals in June, July this year to uh, undertake an initial um, pre-implementation evaluation prior to a, a more robust uh, evaluation following on from that. John. Do you want to say a few last words? And I'll drive away in a car. It's a bit ominous. <laughs> last words. Um, so uh, what we presented um, briefly is uh, are examples of theoretically underpinned, co-produced with patients, um, interventions to, um, to prevent errors happening in the first place through the PMOS, um, to learn from errors when they do happen, the development of a multifaceted intervention to raise, raise safety awareness in patients and to look at when something does go wrong how we can teach staff about that. There's a lot of information here. This is a very brief overview. Please look at our website um, or contact us by email or Rebecca or Ian or Susan or Jerry and uh, we'll be happy to provide further information. Thank you. So we've, we've got time for a few questions um, about this, about, to, that we can target to these two speakers. If anybody's got a burning one that they would like to... There's a microphone just behind you, if you'd like to use that. Peter Barner of uh, Central Denmark Region. Thanks for a, a very um, <laughs> um, broad speech, speech on, on a uh, broad um, issue. In Denmark, we have recently opened up our reporting system, error reporting system, to patients and relatives, and we have had astonishingly few reports. Um, you said something about it was the system's fault because the system, so to speak, isn't user-friendly. Could you expand a little on that? Because I have the very the same feeling about our system. It's definitely not user-friendly, and we have no obligation to feedback to patients and, and relatives. Could you expand it on that, please? Uh, that's very interesting, um, Peter. Thank you. I mean, I think we've got... I don't know whether there's anybody else from... anybody here from the MPSA, but we've got a similar um, examples from the UK where attempts to get patient reporting through the National Reporting and Learning System have been largely neglect neglected. I, I suspect it's because it's part of the mainstream health service. This is part of a sort of addendum to reporting systems that staff use. And I think what we've found is that um, patients don't want to go to a website or, you know, find, d dig down into the NHS or Danish health system um, websites to find out where they should report. And, and, and we've, I think we've got to find better ways of capturing that information. And the key message for us from this has been the, the importance of face-to-face -face reporting. How you do this in practice, I don't know, but we're, we're looking at the use of hospital volunteers, for example, at the moment. You know, who are, you know we have a lot of friends of the hospital, people who actively want to be engaged. These could be a perfect um, cohort of people to help go around the wards and capture this sort of information in a human-friendly way. Okay, we'll move on to the next speakers, but first could you put your hands together for these two very interesting speakers. Thank you. 
So the next speaker in this session is, um, and I'll probably say her name incorrectly, but it's Erica um, van der Schrik de Luz. So I hope that was relatively close. She's from the Utrecht in the Netherlands and is a senior consultant with a company called CBO. And um, so I'd like to welcome Erica onto the stage now, please. My name is Erika van der Schrik de Luz, and I'm working for the CBO Dutch Institute for Healthcare Improvement since 2005. I'm working on the teams of patient safety and optimizing processes. And today I would like to share you about the results of patient as consultants in care processes improving safety or not. Welcome everyone. The importance of safety is crucial. Before we, we start, I would like to ask you to put on your safety glasses. I don't see it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Because the safety glasses fit us all. The patient, the family, relatives and healthcare professionals. For example, the story of my father. He was an internal medicine doctor working for large academic hospitals and he was prescribing his own medication when he was seriously ill. Pretty dangerous, don't you think? Because nobody knew what medication he was taking. Even my mother and I didn't know. Optimizing patient safety. Patient safety is high on the healthcare agenda of the governments, healthcare providers, professionals, organizations, and also more and more for patients. But safer care is never risk-free, because organizations for healthcare are risky organizations, high reliability organizations. There are lots of initiatives to reduce unintended harm, and unintended harm is always about reduce risky processes and patients' role is a unique opportunity to reduce risks. Patients' contribution to safer care is still limited because it's always about the responsibility with, which lies with the healthcare providers and not with the patient. Research about the initiatives are in an early stage. There's little insight in effects risks, limitations, and desirability of giving the patients a role in patient safety. Patients as consultants in care processes, improving safety or not. I would like to share you the results of the role of the patients on the research we did in 2009. The first part is about the objective. Second part about the research. Third part about the results. The fourth part about interventions and key opinions. The fifth part is about conclusions, and the second part is about recommendations for further implementation. The central question was, can patients have a role in safety to improve their safety in healthcare, or not? Maybe giving patients a role in patient safety is a solution for tough times, because it has low costs. The personal involvement is very important because patients are the only persons who are expert on their own illness in healthcare. And they also have a unique patient perspective on processes because they are, they are the only persons who follow the entire healthcare process. The research. The research was done for the was done as a qualitative exploratory research for the Netherlands Organization for Health Research and Development in 2009 in Dutch Zon MW. It was the goals were to display international knowledge overview for all healthcare settings with focus on deficiencies about the role of the patient 
and recommendation for further implementation in national patient safety programs. The research approach consisted of three sub-questions to answer the main question. The first part was to describe effects, risks and factors about patient engagement to improve safety. The second part was about identify interventions, existing and not existing, and initiatives to give patients a role. The third part was to collect key opinions from healthcare providers, policy makers, patients, organizations, and other important experts. The methodology of the research consisted of four parts. The first part was an international literature review with 20 keywords in four databases, resulting in more than 500 Dutch and English articles from 1999 to 2009. This resulted in 38 relevant articles analyzed by a matrix of the sub-questions to answer the main question. The second part was an international web search with eight keywords, resulting in 24 initiatives or interventions. We analyzed the interventions by a matrix of the different steps on the stair for the involving the patients. The first part of that stair is information for patients, and the last one of the last step of the stair is the patient on the driver's seat, and that's why they put a racing car here on the stage. Thank you, Isai, for that. <laughs> the third part of the re research was semi-structured interviews by phone with 24 national experts on patient safety, healthcare providers, policy makers, and patient organizations. The last part of the research was an expert meeting uh, with nine national experts to discuss the results, conclusions, and the further recommendation for implementation. Summarized a literature review, web search, interventions, and an expert meeting. And you can all read it in the research report, which I can provide after, in, 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 after the presentation. The third part is about the results of the research. The description of effects of giving patients a role in patient safety. Engaging patients is crucial to enhance patient safety because patient safety is teamwork and patients are members of the team. Only patients participate during the entire care process and they have a unique perspective, perspective on care process, processes but it's always on a voluntary basis. Because when we come to the description of risks, partner in care depends on the willingness and the ability of patients, because not every patient would like to participate as a member of the team, and not every patient is able to participate, because some patients can't speak up. Healthcare providers can use the eyes and ears of the patients as extra verification moment in the healthcare process, as additional knowledge to their own knowledge. But they keep the full responsibility for safety of their patients. Description of factors, also very important, because we already said that healthcare remains a risky process. You need conditions for patients so that they can dare to express signals of feeling unsafe, of being aware of special situations. And at the other side, there is also need for conditions for healthcare professionals to engage patients and to identify situations. The summary of the results about the effects, the most important thing, thing is engaging patients is crucial to enhance patient safety. Risks. Partner in care depends on the willingness and ability of patients. Factors. Healthcare remains a risky process. A few months ago, someone asked me, what is your work about? And I said, well, I'm working on patient safety. He said, what is the definition of patient safety? And I couldn't even remember that, <laughs> because for me it was a normal term of work. But he said, 
is it really possible that it's unsafe in hospitals? And I said, well, I probably better can't answer this question to you. <laughs> Uh, the fourth part is interventions and key opinions of healthcare professionals, experts, policymakers, and patients. First, the interventions. In the Netherlands, there is an intervention to engage patients. It's called the Dutch National Patient Safety Card. Help us to treat you safe. Healthcare organizations can download this card and use it uh, for their patients. And the next step is to create a card also for healthcare professionals. Because some professionals say, well, I'm a registered nurse or registered doctor, so I don't need to do more for safety because it's in my registration. Other interventions are about international campaigns. And I think these campaigns are really good because it creates awareness and understanding for patients and healthcare providers and professionals who become a patient. But in the Netherlands, healthcare uh, campaigns are not very common because uh, the ministry is not very uh, well common with that. Other uh, interventions we saw were 20 tips, 20 tips to help prevent medication errors from the ARC in USA. When I refer to my father, this is a very important part because one of the tips is to write down your medication history to show that to healthcare providers and talk about that so that they know what, you, what medicine you are taking. And in the WHO High Five project on which I'm working for the Netherlands, we also see that when you implement standard operating pro protocols, that it's most important to involve the patient because we did that for medication reconciliation and we found a 75% reduction of medication errors by interviewing patients within the standardized process about their medication history because they are the only persons who know how they take their medicine. Another example is ask me three questions about my health. What is my main problem? What do I need to do? And why is it important for me to do this? We found that the most interventions are often aimed at individual patients, not yet for healthcare providers or patients groups. Patient safety is teamwork, but awareness about the role of the patient, education, how to give a role to the patients, skills to create a role for the patients, and self-efficacy or confidence in own ability are still limited. We need to create understanding by good practices. And one remarkable quote of the interviews was, empowerment is quite difficult when you are ill. We all know that when you go to, a, to your GP and when you come out of the room that you still have questions because you are a bit nervous or other factors. There is need for an open dialogue between healthcare professionals and patients about safety. And the need is necessary on four levels. The individual care process, the micro level. Healthcare organizations level, the meso level. National healthcare systems, macro level. And supported by laws and regulations on the system level. This is needed to create an integrated approach to sustain the role of the patient. The fifth part, the conclusions of the research. Patient's role, there's no one size fits all. It depends on the values of the healthcare professional and the patients. It depends on the culture of your country and it depends on the healthcare system of your country. How can we address the role of the patients? We could address this to connect to current interventions and to evaluate new interventions and also to innovate the current interventions. And to involve both patients and healthcare providers, not only the patient. Made to measure conclusions. 
there is an active dialogue necessary about awareness, education and skills and self-efficacy. And there's also need to motivate healthcare professionals to engage patients within the safety part. The starting point is the relationship between the professional and the patient in the room during an appointment. In the Netherlands, it appears that we are quite experienced in engaging patient councils in healthcare organizations. But there is also another side of that part, because we don't create enough possibilities for them to help us redesigning healthcare processes, for example, more insight in indicators, protocols, guidelines, etc. So these patient councils has to be better professionalized and facilitated to fulfill this role. Limitations of the role of the patient. The healthcare process itself, because it's a risky process. There's lack of transparency and reliability. It has to be very clear for patients to choose between healthcare providers, so they, have, they need more understanding about guidelines, protocols, indicators, etc. And it also depends on the patient's willingness and ability. So, one conclusion is that the patient can be used only as a consultant of their own care process because the responsibility lies always with the healthcare professional. Summary of the conclusions. Available international research is still limited. So that's a challenge for us all, I think. The patient's role depends on the healthcare system, culture and values of the healthcare professionals and patients. Patient councils and organizations are to be better facilitated and professionalized. Limitations apply because there's lack of transparency and reliability and there are mostly interventions on individual effects. There's no one size fits all. The central question, can patients have a role in patient safety to improve their safety? The answer is yes. It's a must, not only desirable. The pros are that it's maybe a solution for tough times because of the low costs. High involvement is important because patients are the only expert of their illness and they have the only overview of the entire care process. Issues are the abilities of patients, the culture in which you are and the risk of the processes. Recommendations for implementation, the last part. To create an integrated approach for implementation, there is need for creating the role on four levels. On the system level, by evaluate and optimize laws and regulations and create a more open dialogue about incidents and errors. On the ma macro level, there is more need for a transparent and more reliable healthcare system for patients and create their insight in protocols, guidelines, indicators and other parts of healthcare. On the meso level, there is need for program skills for healthcare professionals and organizations where they can find interventions which they can use by creating a national or maybe international information and knowledge institute. On the micro level, that's all between the relation, that's all about the relationship between the healthcare professional and the patient. The patient's role depends on the specific situation and context. It depends on the illness of the patient, it depends on the values of the healthcare professionals and patients and the system and the culture. And there's need for research on effects of current initiatives. We summarized the integrated approach for implementations in a pallet. And the most important part of the pallet is the white color where we symbolize the relation between the patient and the healthcare professional because the white color is the sum of all colors around and that's the micro level. And when I come back on the story of my father, I can tell you that on a sunny 
Sunday afternoon, I told him that um, in a few weeks you probably enter the hospital and nobody knows what medicine you are taking. So I think it's very important that you write down what medication you are taking. And I was working as a home nurse at that moment, so maybe that was also why I was thinking about that. But he, he wrote it down and he took it to the hospital. And I would like to ask you, who of you has a list of your own medication in your purse or in your pocket? Nobody? Maybe that's the first thing to do tomorrow. So tomorrow, what are you do how would you like to engage your patients or yourself as a patient to engage a role of patient safety, seeing through your patient's eyes? With notes of effects, risks and factors, interventions, key opinions and closing gaps. So that's my last question for you. Is there someone who has an idea about that? What would you like to do? tomorrow or Monday when you're back from Paris? Someone? Nobody knows? <laughs> well, then I leave you with a message that you can write down your medication tonight and put it in your purse, just for safety. This was the end of my presentation. I can provide your di digital version of the research if you like. You can give me your card or send me an email. Thank you very much. And once again, thanks very much, Erica. We've actually got some time. We've got a little bit of time for questions. If anybody's got any questions about the involvement of patients with this particular um, approach that's been used and the research that's been um, undertaken. Anybody got any questions at this moment in time? I think from a um, sort of an, an implementation science point of view, it certainly raises issues about the transferability of the, you know, and, and the need for further, further studies because what's predominantly, you know, quite a, a limited population, it'd be interesting to see sort of the, the wider, the wider um, perspectives, particularly with different um, healthcare settings. So now, as I say, it's certainly an interesting piece of work and you've raised some <laughs> questions for us yeah. and some challenges that we now need to follow up on. Lots of work to do, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so thanks, thanks again. Could we put your hands together for you. Erica, please? And so our um, final speaker for the um, session um, today is um, Rick Edema, and he's from um, Sydney in Australia. And um, again, he's going to be talking about um, patient expectations, but this time, when, you know, when, particularly when things go wrong. And um, you know, we've, be, we've been hearing quite a, a, a regular theme today that you know, healthcare is unsafe, as most of us are aware. So Rick, over to you. Thanks, Brady. Um, yeah, I've been asked to talk about the, uh, the things to do when uh, there are unexpected outcomes in care. Um, one of the things I should say, though, in response to the previous talks, is that uh, you know, we should really applaud what both teams have been doing. Uh, it's absolutely critical uh, f to involve patients in these various ways. Uh, as was uh, indicated by the research that we did now, and we have been doing over the last four or five years, talking to patients and their families in the case of death after there was an incident. And that is what I'd like to report on now quite quickly in the remaining time. I should acknowledge the team that contributed to this work, and particularly Dr. Sue Ellen Allen, who was the senior researcher on the project. What concerns patients when things go wrong? I'd like to just play you a clip briefly of one of the video interviews that we did with people during 2009 and 10. Uh, and we have started to video these interviews because they're incredibly powerful and um, it's very important, I think, to, to hear from patients themselves uh, what they have to say about these things. Uh, just uh, in response to the question, how do you get people to actually talk about these kinds of issues? Well, talk to the people who have experienced an unexpected outcome. Those people will have plenty to say. 
We need to talk to people on their terms and not on our terms, through our systems and through our approaches to wanting information from patients. They have plenty to say, as you will hear from this particular person, when things go wrong in their or their relative's care. Um, this person will respond to some questions that we put to her about her mother's care. Her mother was bounced between a couple of hospitals and died in the end due to an incident. Oh, where did that go? The, I hope the sound engineer is present here so that um, the sound level can be properly adjusted. The patient or their voice, their person, needs to leave these meetings feeling that they have been heard. That should be your first goal because you cannot take back what was done. You have to be truly open and transparent about the procedure. You need to make sure that people walk away feeling that they've been heard for closure. Everyone deserves that. And closure does not mean putting someone's scalp up on a wall. It doesn't mean that you want someone terminated or their position to be germinated. It shouldn't mean that. It should go way beyond that. It's about treating people with dignity throughout the process and to acknowledge their pain. I, I am floored by the fact that these people deal with these issues every day and yet behave this way. I cannot get my head around that. I believe that patient care is all about people regardless of their journey. I think that if you are truly going to have this in place, then you must be very clear about timelines, procedures. You need to have a voice, somebody to clearly say to you, this is what you are within your rights to ask and say or to request. You must have documentation of that all the way because people are emotional and sometimes they might need to see something in writing and in their own time and space read something. You know, we should also feel that we have some choice in interview times, in meeting places, all of those little things and yet they might seem little to a clinical person but all of those things mean a lot. All of those things speak about truly caring? Are we just ticking boxes or are we truly caring about someone's journey? We talked to more than 100 people, about 80% of whom had been involved in high severity incidents. We talked to a lot, of, a lot of family members for that reason because the incidents involved death. Many of the interviews went like the one you've just heard. Many people are very upset and very sad. Many people are still very angry about not having had the opportunity to sit down with the people who cared for them and talk to them about the kinds of issues that matter to them. This really drives uh, much of my research agenda at the moment to make it clear that for people involved in incidents, the main thing is to be able to dialogue about questions, issues and concerns that they want to bring to the service's attention, to the clinician's attention, and perhaps to other people who have bearing on how the health system and the health service is organized. The last project we did on uh, disclosure of incidents is called the 100 Patient Stories Project and I should acknowledge Dr. Christine Jorm who was really the originator of this particular project at the Australian Commission for Safety and Quality in Healthcare. Um, we had a number of universities around Australia because we wanted to talk to people around Australia. Uh, we wanted to collect uh, interviews from at least 100 people, analyse those interviews we were charged with developing indicators for effective open disclosure and I'll present some important principles that we derived from this work in a moment. 
uh, we needed to test support for those indicators through a national stakeholder consultation that we did, uh, develop a couple of uh, survey tools that are ready to now, and produce media radio video records, some of which um, uh, you will be uh, shown here. The sample of people, we talked to more than 100 people, 119, 120 thereabouts all up. 28 were referred to us through health services. Two came from consumer organizations, 43 through the national print media, we put an ad in the national newspapers, uh, and 27 through a market research company that uh, got into contact with people online, um, adding up to um, the numbers that you see there on the screen. The somewhat disappointing thing here is that the health services that we contacted around Australia, we contacted 21, only nine of whom gave us ethics approval to talk to patients about incidents that they had experienced. I think that is an ethical problem in and for itself that we need to take up with ethics committees. The nine participating health services referred us 28 interviewees. I think that is another ethical issue that we need to address. If we want to start talking to patients and families about issues that matter to them, we need to make it possible for these people to speak to researchers like us about issues that matter to them. Most of the incidents that patients related to us uh, happened in medical inpatient settings, surgical and emergency departments. The mean age of the patients was 57.9. Uh, Some of the interviews concerned babies. Other interviews concerned old age patients who had died. So we go straight from the zero to 100 age spectrum. What we found, I've given you some kind of flavor of the kinds of things that we found. A great sadness on the part of patients and families not to have been able to talk more about the issues that matter to them. But what we learned, too, more specifically, is that it wasn't necessarily about blame for these people. It was often more about needing to know why things had happened and hearing that it didn't or wouldn't happen again. Blame was something that arose predominantly in response to patients and relatives not being granted the opportunity to speak about issues that matter to them. The other thing that we learned was things rarely go wrong in isolation. You rarely have the big bang incident. Quite often patients and relatives told us stories about gradual build-ups, things that were seen coming a mile off, things that were in the air because conditions weren't talking to each other, because doctors and nurses weren't talking to each other, because there was incidents happening with other patients and so forth. The third thing is that patients and families want there to be a just culture um, kind of dialogue. They want the dialogue to be able to talk about their concerns about specific individual clinicians. And I know that this veers dangerously close to blaming individuals. But for patients and families, that is an issue that cannot be swept under the table. And for us to go into these kinds of discussions and say blame is not something that is discussable here, is to not understand where patients and families are coming from, to not take the time to educate people about the complexity of healthcare, the shared responsibilities of clinicians in their tasks and so forth, and to not guide them through these emotional problems that people have in response to something very bad happening to them or their, their relatives, and make them see that blame is indeed not the right answer in these situations. I will not bother you with the quotes for now because you can read them in the papers that we have published. The other thing that we learned then is that when you talk to patients and families about things going wrong in healthcare, for them there's four ways in which things can go wrong. Sometimes it can be that it just can't be helped. Granddad was in bed five, uh, a 50-year-old guy was in, by, in, in bed three, and the MET team, the medical emergency team, went to the bed to bed three and did not have time to deal with granddad in time. 
and people are understanding of these things. There were a lot of problems trying to get him into ICU. There was some, somebody, somebody else out on the ward that was crashing, so the crash team had gone there, and this was not an isolated story. Patients and relatives are very attuned to the problem of disorganization or a lack of managerial interventions in problems that they could see needed to be fixed and would have needed to be fixed way back in the past, but were not. Subsequently, we learned that this incident happened six times every day and was allowed to keep on happening. The third mode of things going wrong for patients and families is inattention. If there's an individual who's too fatigued or perhaps doesn't have the right skills or knowledge or whatever, um, and these people individually could be said to, um, to be behind what went wrong. For example, she said she looked around the corner, she checked on him, he was sleeping peacefully, and then, you know, she had to go and do something else, and she thought, you know, she won't disturb him. And that's when the patient got out of bed, fell and broke femur, um, and this patient subsequently died. Again, here, this is not said that he intend to blame, but people are just allocating sources of cause, and I think this is something that we all need to understand is a critical component of patients and relatives trying to understand things going wrong in healthcare. The last thing, and unfortunately we had quite a bit of feedback about this, is carelessness or, if you like, recklessness. They became frustrated that the patient's post cesarean infection was an extra push in their time. So a lot of staff would come and they would, wouldn't repack it in the same way, they wouldn't read the notes, so the wound pro progressively got worse. We got stories of conditions avoiding patients. Um, these kinds of things upset people very much uh, on top of, of course, the incident that affects them physiologically. Besides all that, though, we also had stories of people being able to talk about their incidents with conditions in the services and make sure that these discussions became somewhat more productive. This is an example of a mother who lost her baby due to a transportation incident. The baby needed to be transported from the adult hospital to the pediatric hospital uh, for um, diaphragmatic hernia surgery. Uh, the uh, transportation machine failed. There was two machines, uh, very expensive, $50,000 machines that failed. The third one finally got the baby to where the baby needed to be, but it was too late and the baby died. And the mother was present during all this, and she was very much affected. Her family was very much affected. What she was able to do, though, is to go back to her neonatal intensive care doctor and say, why haven't you looked into this transportation problem? What is your survival rate for congenital diaphragmatic hernia babies? And they sat down, they looked at the problem, they fixed it to some extent as best as they could with the surgeons and management and upped the survival rate of these babies to around 90% as is world standard. I just want to play you Alicia's clip where she talks about her experiences. The sound person, if he or she's there, this is a very quiet clip, so if you could up the sound, that would be very much appreciated. Is the sound person there? It definitely depends on who you get to talk to. Some people, like, you know, there's no way that you could talk to them about it. And I know, you know, they're brilliant at their job, but as I said, like, for instance, with having the battery backup on the unit, that's just a fairly common sense sort of thing. Um, but a lot of people um, did put up their blinkers, um, didn't want to know about it, and I don't know if it's part ego or whatever else, but that's why you do... I was blessed in that I found the right, the right doctors looked after our child, after our loved one, and they were open to change. And, uh, and part of me also feels that in a lot of ways they were relieved that... Um, that I was able to, I was the catalyst for change because they had been jumping up and down or I had felt these similar concerns for a long time and they mentioned it, but within their own 
bureaucracy, they couldn't get it changed. But obviously, someone because of the catastrophic event, they had to, they had to do it. And um, it does very much play into how open and receptive the doctors are. I um, just want to move on now to the principles, not the indicators, we couldn't really call them indicators, that we were able to derive from the hundred or so interviews that we conducted with patients and families. Um, this is published, uh, so if you want to look it up afterwards, then that's very well possible. Incident disclosure is part of incident management. Incident disclosure staff has been appointed. Decisions are made in agreement with the patient. An incident disclosure, disclosure booklet is made available, explaining what disclosure is about. An incident disclosure record is initiated so that the service remembers who they talked to and what they said. There is appropriate incident disclosure communication, and what that means, of course, is a huge area on its own that we don't have time to talk about now. Excratia support is in principle available. Investigation progress is shared. And this is a contentious issue too because investigations are very often privileged, that is, secret. Closure occurs when the patient or the family is satisfied. And satisfaction with the incident disclosure process is measured, not just for patients, but also for staff. In conclusion, instant disclosure is an opportunity, is what we realized, particularly when we listened to people like Alicia and other interviewees who told us that sitting down with clinicians to talk about the unexpected outcome gave them an opportunity to negotiate issues that concerned them about the process of care, about specific people's attitude, about particular people's communication approaches, and so forth. So what we learned is that incident disclosure really should restore the clinician-patient relationship to ensure mutual healing. And if the clinicians involved in the incident could be invited to talk to patients and relatives, then that would certainly answer one of patients and their relatives' most uh, strong wish. It should strengthen clinicians' resolve to improve practice and make it safer. Openness amongst clinicians is important through reporting and investigation. But openness to patients and relatives throws a very different light on the matter. It throws a, an affective, affective light, an emotional light on what went wrong, giving the investigation perhaps, and clinicians need uh, to improve care, special impetus. And finally, it should enable patients to learn about and contribute to relevant cl clinical practice improvements. Patients admittedly do come in to services expecting things that are not always achievable. And the public also needs to be educated about what is possible, about how complex care is, and how often things can go wrong. Quite often we do not take the time to do that, and that is a critical component of this whole process. I would like to finish uh, with repeating the point that I made at the beginning, that if we want to get feedback from patients and families about care, a good place to start is with those people who have experienced unexpected outcomes, and to listen to them when they knock on our door and want to talk about what went wrong. Those are the people who've got energy and momentum, not just to talk about their own incidents, but often, as we experienced, write books about how the service should improve its own managerial and clinical processes, write to all sorts of other people about how the service should be improved. There's all sorts of things that these people are willing and capable of doing. And Alicia, the person you just heard, the mother who lost her baby, is one of those. She's now active in the New South Wales Health uh, context by acting as someone who's got lots of energy and momentum, talking to clinicians about the importance of being open about unexpected outcomes in care. I just want to finish then showing you uh, this poster about the uh, incident disclosure conference that we're organizing in Sydney, the 4th and the 5th of October of this year. And the um, center or the uh, conference website is down below there. Thank you very much.
I'm sure that's given us all a lot of um, food for thought. And has, has anybody got any questions? Because I'm sure that it's... Yep, we've, um, would you like to go to the mic nearest microphone? Rick, would you like to come and respond? Pete Barner, again, from Central Denmark Region. I'm a regional risk manager, and what I in, in, see in my practice um, is, is a lot about psychological defense. In your closing remarks, you state um, all the advantages of, of um, the blame-free culture of, of open disclosure, but how do you go about the normal psychological defenses in each and every one of us to um, try and avoid this? I mean, I've been working with so many senior doctors, senior nurses, who are brilliant uh, communicators, but when it comes to this um, feeling of, of, of personal attack, of um, breakdown of your, your uh, existential anxiety, uh, then they sort of, of uh, close up. How do you deal with this? Well, that, that, that is an excellent question, but the question has uh, answers at various levels. Uh, the, the systemic level needs to be addressed through making it possible for people to speak about incidents without that information ending up in court. Um, there's all sorts of responses that people can take to that, to no fault situation, uh, people can privilege disclosure, although I'm not in favour of that. And there are other things like that. There could be, like we're developing in Australia now, a disability uh, compensation scheme where people who are harmed in any way can go and get compensation, get money, to deal with their needs and look after those without having to go through the legal system to uh, sue the doctor or the nurse in, in question to get money out of the system. At the personal level, what we need to do is to educate clinicians differently. We need to do very different things with doctors than what we're currently doing. We need to do very different things with nurses than what we're currently doing. Um, I think we need to make it compulsory as part of junior doctor and, and later registr registrar training to get these people to talk about issues and concerns they have about their own work. We need to make it possible for these people to debrief themselves and each other about issues that didn't go well. We know now that junior clinicians experience, up to 90% of them experience serious incidents in care, 50% of whom is directly involved in serious incidents. Uh, a paper by White et al. that came out in 2008. These people need to be involved in disclosure discussions from a very early uh, point in their, their uh, learning career. And I don't agree with people who say that these people are too young to begin to talk about incidents or about incident disclosure. Thank you very much for an excellent uh presentation. My name is Ola Baltusson. I'm uh, from Landspital University Hospital in Iceland. Uh, I have two comments, if I may. Uh, one is on uh, the legal uh, issues that, that may be linked to, to the transparency issue. Uh, back home, we're having a very positive experience with increasing transparency and being much quicker to go to the family and, 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 and uh, the patient about things that go wrong. At the same time, we're also seeing some changes in the, in the legal uh, part of things. Uh, uh, a bit of uh, ambulance chasing mentality, if you will, uh, sometimes uh, talked about in the US. Uh, maybe there's not a causal relationship between the two, but, but uh, maybe you can comment a little bit about, about that. And the second comment I have is, uh, are you working with positive stories as well uh, in, 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 in a strategic way as, as you're working with negative stories? Uh, to take your second question first, yes, we are working with positive stories because I think those are critical to giving clinicians the confidence to start engaging with uh, the kinds of issues that we're talking about here and to show that it's possible for them to engage in conversations that can be hard but that can have very positive outcomes. Now, I just need to take you back to your first question. You're asking me about a causal relationship between two things and what were they again? So, so uh, I'm sorry, it was a bit too, too, too complicated. So, so uh, can you comment on the legal uh, uh, issues uh, related to increasing transparency? Yeah, um, that is a complicated question because our legal systems tend to be different. Uh, even in Australia, we've got five or six different systems within the one country. Uh, with some states making it possible for people to apologize for an incident without that apology or what was offered 
by way of explanation, ending up in court or being able to be tabled in court, whereas in other states it is possible to apologise and offer an explanation with that explanation then ending up in court. It's very confusing for people in Australia, let alone uh, for people around the world, dealing with all sorts of different legal responses to the issue of incident disclosure, liability, um, and, um, and service liability too. Uh, my personal view on the whole matter is that we should really try to delegalize disclosure. Now, this is a contentious statement, I know, uh, but I take heart from friends in America, particularly Rick Boothman and Tim McDonald, who have taught me to say, just do it. Because if you do, uh, Steve Kramen, I should mention, if you are open and honest, what ends up in court is that you've been open and honest. If the story is not clear, what will end up in court is that the story is not clear. But you have not tried to dissimulate, you've not tried to hide information from the people who most need it to come to terms with their harm. To legalize disclosure, to even pretend that we can turn it into a privileged, that is a secretive situation, I think is untenable. Uh, it, it leads to a very cramped kinds of communication, where what we should really have is open communication. Now, I know this sounds idealistic, and we need to be realistic about the constraints that attach to this, but again, I'm referring to the work that Tim McDonald, Steve Kramen, and Rick Boothman are doing in their respective jurisdictions in America. In Michigan, now, apparently, and this is anecdotally from Rick Boothman, who's the um, uh, senior risk officer at the Michigan Health System there in uh, Ann Arbor, he related to me last year that law firms are closing around Ann Arbor because the Michigan health system is just too honest with its patients and families. And that is what I'd like to see happening in Australia as well and elsewhere. There's, there's, yep. I'm uh, uh, Dan Cohen. I'm a physician, uh, international medical director for Datix, one of the vendors here. And I'm, previously, I was the chief medical officer for a very large international health plans. So I've looked at safety and quality for a long time. The engagement of, we've heard some really interesting talks this morning. I think the, the engagement of patients early on in the process of coming into healthcare settings is very important. Most of us tend to disregard the messages we hear on airplanes that tell us how to put on our life jacket because we think, we know that the possibility of the airplane coming down in water is extraordinarily small. But the possibility of dying when you're coming in the hospital is actually not small at all. And I think engaging patients without frightening them is hugely important, and we need to look for mechanisms to do that. Regarding your comment about your comments about disclosure, which I think are really elegant, uh, as physicians, we should not eat our young. Our, our goal is to nurture our young, and I, and I agree completely that the training of junior physicians and medical students in the processes of disclosure are very important because they will at some time in their career more than likely be involved in an adverse event that will require disclosure. And physicians in training at all levels should do this and using sham patients. And pa There's all kinds of methodologies for doing this, but it's hugely important. So I just wanted to commend you on your work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. Yeah, the gentleman. Okay. Yes, I'll be, I'll be brief. Uh, Jerry Armitage. Hello, Rick. Hi, Jerry. Pleased to meet you. That was an excellent, uh, very passionate presentation. Thank you. It, it's a comment, I think, more than a question, but um, when we all get together like this, I presume one of the uh, most important things is to see a synergy between the different work streams. And uh, I'm leading on the um, patient led reporting scheme that John Wright commented on earlier. And you mentioned the incident cascade, and I think it's very interesting that from our work we can see that patients are remarkably insightful about the beginnings of that incident cascade in their reports to us. Of course, uh, elucidating that information depends on both the structure of the reporting and the process, which John commented on in our case, face to face. But it is quite remarkable that patients will pick out if they are spoken to properly and listened to appropriately, they will pick out the beginnings of what we call active failures in the organisational accident model. So I think there's an awful lot of overlap here and that's helpful. 
Yeah, thanks, Jerry. Jerry, and I wanted to commend you again on, and, and your team on uh, the PERT, uh, which I think is a critical initiative, the patient incident reporting uh, uh, thing. What's the T stand for? Patient <laughs> incident reporting tool. Tool, that's right. Um, because that offers a way for people to begin to talk precisely about these hints that they see happening um, and that they worry about, they would love to communicate to clinicians who could do something about that and fix it for them, because they can see things coming. Yeah. Thank you. We've, we've got a question, the lady at the back. Ellen Dalkos, a physician from Norway, and working with the patient safety campaign there. According, um, in relation to uh, the psychological stress for doctors and nurses when they have to communicate about this, I'm thinking that it's very important that they have the support from their leaders uh, in that conversation because mm -hmm. the latent um, failures uh, are not always so easy for the clinicians to um, explain and do something about. So I'm glad you said that this is um, part of incident management. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Now, um, we've grilled Rick, um, but it's been fascinating, and he's certainly raised the issue. Um, I'm a chair of an ethics committee, and um, certainly, as I say, I think there's some real learnings that do need to go um, to the ethics committees. Now, if we've got any questions for the other speakers as well, we've got a couple more minutes, so if, you, you know, if anybody's got a burning question that they'd like to ask. No movers at the moment. Okay, well in that case then, what I'd like to do is ask you to um, thank the um, very interesting speakers that are from the session this morning and lots of things to take home.